Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Maliki Yawm al-Din Al-Ladhi Lahu Mulku al-Samawati wal-Ard Wa huwa bi kulli shay'in alim All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his blessed name, the most merciful to all of his creation, the one who, is, who extends a special mercy to the believers, the owner of the day of judgment, to him belongs that which is in the heavens and that which is upon the earth. <coughs> And he is the one who has knowledge over and about all things. Washhatu an la ilaha illallah. Al-Wahadu al-Qahar. And he is alone in his names and attributes, the mighty, the majestic. Washhatu anna Muhammad, washhatu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُ مَمْلُوكٍ لَهُ And I bear witness that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam is his servant and his messenger and he belongs to Allah. ثُمَّ أَمَّا بَعْدْ فَإِنَّ أَسْتَقَ الْحَدِيثِ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَالَى To move forward, verily, verily, the most truthful narrative, the most truthful speech is the Book of Allah, the Mighty, the Sublime. Wa khayru huda li ittiba' kamilan huda Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And I bear witness that the finest guidance to follow to emulate in totality, which includes every place and every time, is the guidance of our Prophet Mustafa alayhi salatu wasalam, the chosen one as the last Prophet and Messenger. And for those who follow that way, meaning from his companions all the way down to the last day, for them is khair. For them is good and this life and the hereafter. One that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you listen to the Kulli Kaul wa Amal. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us and make us sincere in every statement and action. One Yahdiyana ila Sawab and guide us to that which is the right and that which is proper in this timely fashion. Wabat. Insha'Allah wa ta'ala, today we'd like to begin our program here at Masjid Ibad rahman with a general topic of discussion concerning building community and maintaining it. And although I've been chosen for this task, when Allah the tawfiq Wa alayhi musta'an wa alayhi tawakkilna wa ilayhi al-masir. And I ask Allah to help me, to make me, insha'Allah ta'ala, upon guidance in doing this, and that he gives me a good outcome. Ameen. <clears throat> Although I've been chosen for this, I may not be the best one. Wa la hawla wa la quwwata billah. And it's going to require some of the people to help, insha'Allah ta'ala. One way that it will be very appreciative, the help of the people and the community, is that me, myself, I know who's in front of me. That I have some idea of some of the names of the people. Um, and for women, it's going to be maybe a little touchy because some women don't like to um, speak 
because of the issue of um, men. And we know this is not extremism. As the scholars have mentioned in their books such as Ibn Qabam al-Maqdasi and the likes of them, the issue of the lady, is it permissible for her to call the adhan and the qama? And there are different takes and looks at this. Basically, women should not be prohibited from calling adhan and iqama because it is ibadah. And this is one take. Then the others say that if men are around where the voice can be heard, yani, then it becomes macro. So this point shows that some people are not going to like if it's yani, that which is a little lesser degree of the voice of the woman to be heard. So there's no blame on them in that. Others don't mind as they see it to be from the dhikr, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, the interaction which makes it okay and necessitates that the woman be heard in this regard. So any women that want to um, speak is understand this is one of the ways that the people have dealt here. May Allah bless them then it's okay. But for the brothers, I'm in front of them, it's a little more direct that I know some of the people's names um, so that I may call on them throughout the sessions for um, participation, inshallah ta'ala. So for starters, I'll say my name is Ukasha. Notice I left off Sheikh, alhamdulillah. Ukasha is sufficient. Don't say brother Imam, <laughs> brother minister, and like the brothers say, Sheikh Imam, brother. <laughs> Ukash is sufficient. Naam. And then we have to our right, somebody could tell me what's his name, and we'll need somebody to maybe um, help um, when people raise their hand to say, okay, go ahead. Because if I ask a question, I don't have the ability to see who has their hand raised and I understand this took place last night so that person didn't get a chance to answer um, when they in fact have their hand up so um, who wants to volunteer themselves to kind of like handle this on the floor when people raise their hands say okay the brother who raised his hand go ahead rather than people just blurting out I'll do it okay tell you and who or I'll do it what's your name Hawk. it's Hawk okay so Okay. Okay, great. And your name is? Uh, I go by Jamila. Jamila, Barakallahu Fiki. Naam. This is good. And uh, we have Brother Ishaq on this side and Sister Jamila on the social side. And not trying to um, uh, make policy or um, change anything but particularly when it comes to the salat many of the people of the contemporary scholars because this wasn't an issue the further we go back women being seen or not seen in the masjid just as um, um, rampant um, pictures and different images wasn't an issue the further you go back which helps to make um, difficult for people the issue of fear on Allah and lowering the gaze and not looking at the women and so forth. The issue of petition most of the contemporary scholars have mentioned when it's time for salah that those women must see. And this is why some people they have, if it's a barrier, they have a, what's called a monitor. And yeah, and, and when we were um, in Asheville, when I was the imam, the petition, you can roll it and move it. And I would tell the people at Salat time that they have to open it enough that some of the women can see because if the Imam goes into Rukur, which is bowing, or if he makes sajda, which is full prostration, and they can't see, perhaps they will perceive the Imam, which is one of the things that most of the scholars say is haram at most. And I mean, at least it's haram, it's prohibited to go before the Imam. Or that at most it nullifies the person's salat. So this is one of the things that um, when you make salat, the women have to see unless they're in a separate building, 
Then there's a hadith that says you know, the issue of moving with the takbira. But most of the text, bringing them together, it shows hearing and seeing. So this will be one of the situations for salat where it will be cracked or if not a monitor or something, naam, inshallah ta'ala. And likewise, for the knowledge, it's okay if the sisters want to crack it with permission of administration, however they do it, or if someone is going to, um, like you said, be responsible for the um, interaction and helping in that process. So it's up to um, Brother Nazi, who's here on my left, whichever choice the people want to go with, <coughs> it's fine with me. Tayyip, he said, if you want, you can crack it, inshallah. Let them crack it, yeah. Let them crack it. Yeah, let hmm. them crack it. Yeah. So the women can adjust it however they want in order that some can see or whatever that they feel is comfortable. And um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the aider, inshallah. Naam. So we'll start with um, from the right. We'll take the brother to mention his name so that we will know, like, who. And some of the people are, and then we'll take one from the back. Sisters, if they don't feel comfortable saying, comfortable saying their name, they can say um, their nickname if they're like Om Abdul Rahman. But if it's two Abdul Rahman, Om Abdul Rahman's there, Abdul Rahman's mother, then you can say Om Abdul Rahman Ula. Then I'm the first or senior or whatever. People can work that out. Or if it's 15 Aishas. <laughs> That's going to be hard. So, inshallah. Tayyip. So, from the right. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, salam wa rakat. Muhammad Sultan. Muhammad Sultan, Allah. Jazakumallah khairan. Where are you from, Muhammad Sultan? Uh, originally from Egypt. Originally from Egypt. And you're living here as a local or you're visiting from our town? No, local. Local, barakallah, take Muhammad Sultan. Okay, and we'll take one from the Nisa, inshallah. One from the women can say, Um Mustafa, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, Zakillah Khairan. You are a visitor or you're a local? Tayyip, MashaAllah, Jazakamallah Khairan, Alhamdulillah. Hadha yukafi fi jawabi, Alhamdulillah. It's sufficient, MashaAllah. Then we'll take um, um, the next brother from the right. Khalid Sadiq. Khalid Sadiq, MashaAllah, Khalid Sadiq. And I know he um, is a visitor from out of town. But I'll ask them to be fair anyway. So where are you from? Uh, I'm from Asheville, but I live in Charlotte. He's from Asheville, North Carolina, in the beautiful mountains of Asheville. <laughs> and he's living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, Baraka Lofi. Okay, from the women's side, again, we'll take the next person. Uh, and Sister Sakina, and you're local. MashaAllah. Sister Sakina, and you're local. MashaAllah. Baraka Lofi. Now, from the brother's side, um, from the right. I'm Yusuf Abdul Wahab. Yusuf Abdul Wahab, mashallah. And where are you from, Yusuf? I'm local. You're local. Jazakumallah khairan. Have some locals here today. This is good because when you have programs like this, a lot of times the locals are the, the, the last ones to show up. You look around, everybody's from out of town. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you, locals, inshallah. From the sister side, min fatliki. Sister Maimuna, she's local. Barakallah fi kunna. May Allah bless you all. Naam, from the brother's side on the right. It's Haq. It's Haq. Local? I guess I am. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> MashaAllah, he's a local It's Haq. Everybody knows It's Haq, but maybe some people here don't know, so this is good that he mentions he's local and his name is It's Haq. MashaAllah. From the sister's side, Jazakumallah Khair. MashaAllah, Barakallah Fiq. Jamila from Iowa, Alhamdulillah. And we have some other people there um, coming, inshaAllah, and some people are outside working, inshaAllah. So, inshaAllah, this is from the brother's side on the right. Uh, Abu Hudayfa. Abu Hudayfa. From New York. And he's um, a visitor from outside. He's from New York. So, Mabad Dalek, next. Abu Muhammad Habib Beya. MashaAllah. Abu Muhammad Habib Beya, and he's a visitor also from New Jersey. Zakhmalah Khair. Abu Abdullah, New Jersey. 
Abu Abdullah from New Jersey. Alhamdulillah. La Jersey. Jersey Shore. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> then next from the brothers. Nazi. Nazi Abdul Hakim. MashaAllah. And he's a resident here. Alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feekum. So inshaAllah ta'ala, I may not mention or remember all of the names at times. Please forgive me. Overlook this um, shortcoming. But we have the participation of one another, so we'll ask um, who will take a question. And those um, like Sister Jamila and Brother Ishaq, they're my eyes on the floor. So if I say, um, who will take this question as someone raises their hand, then um, that person who um, is helping out could... Um, point to that person or tell them to go ahead because maybe two people were raised almost at the same time or someone would just want to um, take the question. So we'll use this format for organization purposes, inshallah. What do you think? It's good. good. What do the sisters think? This is good? Okay, alhamdulillah. Barakallahu feek. Tayyip, inshallah. Nam inshallah. Now we will get one uh, expressed to you inshallah. Inshallah, it's coming inshallah. Now, Taya, inshallah ta'ala, before we um, start the first um, segment of the lecture series or conference or Dola seminar, I want to just remind ourselves of some of the benefits uh, being um, in a study circle or in the masjid, uh, remember, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, we apologize for the tardiness. People were tardy, and so we kind of delayed. Allah tabaraku wa ta'ala command us in his book. <coughs> to worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala. To worship him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we mentioned the issue yesterday in Qutbah um, that Ibadah here it means every statement and action. Every statement and action that a person does that Allah Himself loves. And of course, He's going to inform us in His Quran of the love of those things or in His Messenger in His Sunnah will verify and teach us and instruct us as to what are those statements and actions that are loved by Allah then this is that which is known to be a ibadah. So uh, this issue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَأَنَّ مَسَاجِدْ لِلَّهِ فَلَا تَجْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا That verily the places of worship masajid, plural for masjid, masjid, a place of worship, masajid, places of worship, they are constructed, they are for the purpose of worshiping making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here Allah mentioned, فَلَا تَدْعُ مَا اللَّهِ أَحَدًا So don't supplicate to anyone other than Allah in those places of worship. And there's a hadith that the Prophet mentioned, alayhi salatu wa salam, if you want to find it, and we give reference as much as we can so that people could go back and look and check if they want, if they want to use it and their own speech or what have you. Where the Prophet mentioned, it's in the collection of Imam At-Tirmadhi, Imam At-Tirmadhi, which is from um, the group of the most six known and used books on the face of the earth that contain statements, actions, and approvals of the Prophet. And this um, Sahih At-Tirmadhi, the collection of Imam At-Tirmadhi, he mentions the Hadith where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned الدُّعَاءُ هُوَ الْعِبَادَةِ That dua, supplicating, calling Allah's name or asking Him for something is considered an act of worship. So likewise in the verse where Allah said وَلَا تَدْعُوا مَا اللَّهِ فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَا اللَّهِ أَحَدًا So don't supplicate to anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the place to worship. This shows generally any type of worship is for the masjid. And there are many other um, texts that we can um, use to show this point. So 
the reason we're mentioning this as a beginning um, to whatever we're going to take after this is to establish that this is a lofty thing and it's not wasting time it's not being fanatical and rather it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he loves he's pleased with it so this would be what falls under the umbrella of ibadah worship so this is one of the benefits of the masjid and benefits of being in a gathering like this secondly we mentioned yesterday in the talk um, about the virtue of modesty or shyness or al hayau being um, shy to do things wrong in front of Allah or in front of the people or I should say in front of Allah then the people we mentioned the hadith of the Prophet where he mentioned that seven people will have a shade on the day of Yom Al-Qiyamah there will be seven individuals described in this hadith that will have a special shade as Yom Al-Qiyamah they won't they won't be there will not be um, trees and porches and different things to stand under for shade. Yom al is the beginning of a whole new, what we understand, issue of life on this earth. So everything will be different. One of the things is the lack of shade, the lack of trees, the lack of mountains and so forth as we know it in this life here today. So shade will be... Uh, a, a high importance a very needed thing and in this hadith the prophet cited seven descriptions of people they will be the ones that Allah will favor and give to them out of his love and his concern for them a special shade one of them the prophet وسلم, he mentioned two men that love one another because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to love, love one another in the religion so they would love one another as brothers and sisters in the religion and aside from that the prophet mentioned which tama'a alayhi and they gather upon that love what tafarqa alayhi and they dispatch or they leave one another upon that love this is one of the descriptions the prophet gave for people that will have that shade from the seven people in the hadith of Sahih Muslim narrated by Abi Horeva so this is another reason and virtue for being in a place like this because the part of the hadith that's relevant we're gathering upon that love of Islam we're gathering upon loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah we're gathering upon the love for earning the reward and ultimately we hope going to the paradise where we will inshallah be for eternity so these are some of the benefits but we should remember that it should be um, two things in order for this action to be accepted it should be al ikhlas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it should be only to earn the reward from Allah and not to earn the reward but to show off or not to earn the reward but so and so is going to be here I need my money he owes me no it should be solely and those are two examples that we give to show that it's not solely for Allah it's so that you can reap the benefit you can become better as a Muslim and that you can draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the issue of seeking knowledge Knowledge shouldn't be sought in order to debate, to belittle um, one another. Neither should it be to hold status over those lesser, but it should be to rectify the individual, to raise from the individual that which is the level of ignorance that every individual has naturally and to gain piety in order to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to fulfill the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the second thing from the conditions to have this um, seeking knowledge accepted that it should be accepted um, by way of uh, following the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
that the knowledge should be sought the way that the Prophet ﷺ taught the companions in a constructive way. So we want to remind ourselves of those things, the importance of why knowledge is sought, the benefit and the virtues of the knowledge being distributed between the people in the masjid, the role of each individual is important, and that those things are an act of worship in itself, and they will be accepted by Allah. Those actions of worship, such as this gathering, provided that they are sincerely done to gain the reward from Allah, and that they're done in accordance with the legislation, the way of the Prophet wasallam. We want to talk about the issue of building a community, building community, and this is the first segment. Then we'll come back and talk about uh, leadership, such as uh, administration and imamship and the likes, which makes up the community. And then we'll have, inshallah, as the itinerary shows, a break, lunch, dhuhr, not exactly in this order, then we will come back and we will finish up with um, jama'ah or the importance of what the Prophet left concerning jama'ah community and then we'll have PowerPoint which is not very big but inshallah something that the people can see we hope inshallah. So for starters the issue of ummah when we talk about community Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentioned in his noble book, Allah said, and had we wished, and here he's talking about himself. When Allah says we in the Quran, he's talking about himself. As the ulama of the Arabic language, some of the scholars, they have explained that nahnu taqa'ala wahid, that you can use we, which Nahnu in Arabic means we, you can use this pronoun, unattached pronoun or attached pronoun to show one person or one individual, in this case, um, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doing something. So we say person for us and individual for Allah tabaraku wa ta'ala. Don't make the mistake and say person and then reply or relate it to Allah because Allah is not a person. So we say that Allah himself uses we in the Quran talking about himself. And they say this is for the issue of showing um, a great status, for ta'adheem, reverence. So this is okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself uses this and he mentioned that had we willed or desired, we would have made you one ummah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kan and Nasa Ummatan Wahidatan, Baba'at Allah and Nabiyin, Mubashirin, wa Mundirin. Ila akhir ayah. To the end of the verse where Allah said, Mankind was one Ummah. And then Allah sent prophets and messengers as a bearer, a giver of glad tidings, and one to <coughs> deliver the threat from Allah for those who are not from the righteous. So here, Ummah in the Quran, Allah used it in this case showing gathering or people being together. And one of the ways they mentioned Ummah, such as Imam Razi, a famous book called Mukhtar Asiha. Mukhtar Asiha is a classical Arabic dictionary for those who read Arabic and for students, you can also use this book as you graduate more and more towards Arabic. It's an Arabic to Arabic dictionary. Mukhtar Asiha. Very simple Arabic dictionary. And it's by one of the scholars of the past, Imam Razi. And he gives definition based on what's found in the Quran, what's found in Hadith, and he breaks down the word. In this book, he mentioned this issue of Ummah has the same meaning of al jamaa Both of them mean the same. Ummah, like we say, we are one Ummah. And al jamaa we are yani, a jamaa they mean the same. And at times, Ummah refers to being upon 
as they say in English, um, someone help me with this, um, some type of religious creed or some type of um, way that has to do with religious belief. I think they call it dogmat or something like this. This word in English. And um, here Allah mentioned it, showing had he wanted, he would have made everybody upon worship. Nobody would have disbelieved. No one would have chosen deities other than Allah. Everybody would have been on one road, one worship, all the same. But out of his wisdom, out of his knowledge, he didn't choose that. So Ummah here is relative to what we're talking about, building the community. As it relates to gathering, just as jama'a relates to gathering. And this is an important thing when we talk about Islam on a large scale or a small scale because there's no Islam without al-ummah and there's no Islam without al-jama'a. Why? Because they virtually mean the same. To gather upon that which is religiously right. This is basically the meaning of ummah and al-jama'a. So this, when we talk about the importance of it, then we should understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for that reason. And we cite this verse often, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have not created, Allah mentioned, showing that this is the only reason that it's for worship. We have not created the jinn kind nor the mankind except for the worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that being the case, the importance of al-ummah or the importance of al-jama'ah is that we have to be in this world and function and this is the way that Allah wants us to function upon obedience to Him, upon cooperation with one another to <clears throat> live and to try our best to and act our lives upon that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent for humanity. So this is one of the important things about having community, having that which is uh, al-ummah or that which is al-jama'ah. Also one of the meanings of al-ummah, the shaykh, he mentioned his dictionary, al-shay'u aslahu, the origin of something. And this is why Allah, when he talked about Ibrahim, and this is where the concept when we say Ibrahim or in Arab and in, in English, pardon me, Abraham, he's the father of what? What is um, from the right? Can someone who wants to take this question, what is Ibrahim or Abraham the father of from amongst the brothers from the right? If he raises his hand and Ishaq, you moderate for him go ahead or if somebody raises him like this he is the father of Anbiya he said that Ibrahim is the father of the Anbiya is this true from the sister side he said Ibrahim is the father of the prophets meaning he's the first someone said yes tell you Ibrahim and this is uh, one of those technical things, you'll benefit from it. Yes, he's from the first of the messengers and at the same time, he's a prophet that was sent to his people with the scripture. But when you talk about him being from the prophets alone, without saying he's from the first of the prophets and messengers, you have to add that part and messengers, then Adam is from the first prophets and some people disagree but he's from the first of the prophets is the prophet when he made the Isra and the Mi'raj when he went from Mecca to Jerusalem and then to the heavens he described Adam and he mentioned him as being prophet in the ascension to the heavens so we know that Adam was prophet he was inspired and talked to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is the general meaning, basically the simplest meaning for prophet, one that Allah informs. So if Allah informs you and it gives you some instruction in that regard, then 
you become prophet. So Adam is the first prophet to mankind. But Ibrahim, Abraham is the first prophet and messenger with a book. Why do we say first prophet and messenger with a book? Because Noah is the first of the messengers, although he didn't have a book, Allah described him, and the messenger described him in the hadith of Thoban as being, oh, al 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 -ahl al -ar. he's the first one sent, and the prophet described him as messenger to the people of the earth. So when you talk about Ibrahim, he's the first prophet and messenger with the book sent to the people. The first prophet without being messenger at the same time is Adam. And the first messenger, meaning one who's sent out to his people, is Noah without a book. So sometimes messenger means with the book, other times it means without a book, and sometimes a person is a prophet and a messenger, other times he's just a prophet. So the point here about Ibrahim, he was the father of the prophets and messengers going to the people with a revelation, preaching the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why Allah described Ibrahim as an ummah. As he said in the Quran, in the Ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan hanifan wa lam min al mushrikeen. That Ibrahim, Abraham, he was an ummah. So some people would ask, but how could he be a ummah if ummah means a group of people? Because here, if we go back, the definition that the Sheikh gave is that ummah here, it means the origin of something. Like you have Umm al qura the origin of the village or the school in the village. The, the, the thing that everything stemmed from it and now you have different branches and different things that are similar. So Ibrahim, he was described as Ummah, one of the reasons, because he was the one that all of the other people after him took that Tawheed, that concept, as a prophet and messenger that they should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and not make partners with Allah in anything. So Ibrahim is the father of the prophets and messengers. And he himself, Allah described him as Ummah, showing the statement of the Prophet wasallam when he talked about Al-Jama'ah. When he said, you shall see my nation, and remember he said Ummah, you will see my Ummah, meaning those people that gathered together for the sake of worshiping Allah, upon that doctrine that the Prophet ﷺ was sent with. You will see those people who gathered in order to execute that worship, you will find those people after me divided into 73 sects. And then in that hadith, he said, إِلَّا wahid, except one of those groups. So of course the companions, they were eager to know what's the group that's not going to be. Not so much worried about the groups that will be. They want to know the group that's not going to be. And it's okay to do both. To want to know which ones are going to be in the negative sense so that you can avoid it. Avoid it or to skip that and to focus on which ones are going to be in the positive sense so that you can try to achieve it. They chose the positive sense. Which one is going to be exception from the fire? And in one narration, the Prophet said, It is al jamaa So when we go back to this issue of community, the issue of Ummah, the issue of al jamaa it basically means jama, that people come together upon a religious code, doctrine, or way. This is what it means. And when the Prophet said al jamaa he means, as he said in the other narration, clarifying what is al jamaa he said, Ma ana alayya yom wa ashabi. What I'm on in my life means everything that the people have learned from me of statement and action and that which my companions are upon because when the Prophet died, those companions had to carry on the religion. 
This is how we received it from the likes of those companions that passed it down generation, generation after generation. So this is one look at al jamaa and Ummah, that people gather with a common goal. And this doesn't mean that they are upon right or wrong in this case, just that they gather upon a common goal that's tied to a religious creed, a religious doctrine, a religion, a religious way. And in this case of our um, creed, in this case of our prophet, then of course, al-Ummah and al jamaa mean um, jamaa al haq the, the group that gathers to be upon what's right. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun wa atasimu That wow, which is the conjunction between the two verses, is tying the obligation of the believers to fear Allah. And here fear Allah is talking about be afraid of disobeying or overstepping the boundaries of Allah. And give Allah his due right as best you can and we will always fall short in giving Allah his due right and worship because we're humans and Allah huwa ghaniyun anna. He's greater and he's in no need of us. So we always as humans will have that shortcoming but we should try to give it our best in obeying Allah and worshiping Allah. And Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَمُتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ And don't die, don't allow the angel to come to you and you're not in the state of doing that. Staying away from what Allah told you to stay away from, doing what Allah commanded you to do as much as you're able in your physical, mental, and spiritual ability. Then Allah said, وَأَتَسِمُ بِهَبْ لِلَّهِ Showing how that will be achieved. And I command you equally, likewise, to gather and cling, holding to the Hablillah. And the companions, they explain, Habl here means rope. So when you say Hablillah, it means the rope of Allah. Like you say Masjid, means a place of worship. When you say Masjidillah, means the Masjid of Allah. Or Baytullah, it means the house of Allah. So here, Hablillah, the rope of Allah and the companions like the likes of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and others and Abdullah ibn Abbas they describe the rope of Allah to mean the Quran and others mention the Quran and the way of the Prophet as they are both the same revelation they are both the same they are considered revelation the Quran and the way the statements the actions the approvals of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so the word of Jama'a in itself it is comprised of two things. It is comprised of the actual people that gather and the gathering itself. As the scholars have mentioned that a Jama'atu, and this is kind of technical again, in the Arabic, like in English, we have nouns and verbs. We have nouns, which they say people, places, and things, and then you have verbs, which are actions in most cases. In Arabic, the same thing. The word for noun, people, place, and thing is ism. Can you say ism? Can you say ism? ism. Can you say ism? ism. Everybody, ism. ism. And ism in Arabic means a person, a place, or a thing. So ism here is one of the points of the Arabic language that we're talking about describing this issue of al jamaa which is the group. It's a actual thing that you can see. And it is also consists of people. And it also, believe it or not, it consists of a place as this word was firstly used talking about those with the Prophet himself in his time. So this al jamaa too, it has that meaning of a ism, a noun, while at the same time it also shows a action and this changes the word from an ism to what's called masdar in Arabic, masdar and they say masdar is a verbal noun 
What is a verbal noun? A verbal noun is a noun, but at the same time showing action being done from that perspective of a noun. So the issue of al jamaa the scholars have mentioned the origin of it is ijtima'a, to gather. And because it is an action where you can see the people doing that action, gathering, then it is an action and the people at the same time. When you talk about action, then it goes all the way from the Sahaba to our time and beyond our time to the last day, the day of judgment, whoever gathers upon that which the companions of Jama'a, those who were the body of the Muslims during the Prophet's time. So when you say body, the main body of the Muslim, the main body of the Muslim back then was who? The companions of the messenger. So whenever we see al jamaa the first people we should think about, is it us or the companions from the brothers? Companions. companions from the sisters. When we think about and we hear the word al jamaa which we said is the group who gathers upon religious doctrine and creed, do we think about us being al jamaa or do we think about the companions? Which one takes the first meaning, us or the companions of the messenger? Companions. companions. So keeping that in mind, this shows the way to understand communal life and the importance of the community and building the community. That is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it in his book, the way that the Prophet sallallahu actually described it and left it for us from the time of his alayhi salatu wasalam and the companions. So of course, we didn't have to come to Durham and start building um, a masjid out of um, clay brick. No, the building was here. Alhamdulillah, um, people were able to purchase it. But when you talk about building from their perspective, they physically had to build a masjid. Can you imagine that? and the sweat and the hot sun of the summer actually doing construction work brick by brick laying a masjid subhanallah this is some serious dedication but Allah has out of his mercy allowed us to reap that similar benefit for having a place that maybe we buy and we do some cosmetic works or we fix some things and we don't have to build it brick by brick so we get that same residual result and when you talk about the building of a community we understand that they used to have their houses adjacent from the masjid connected to the masjid we don't live like that in these days so when you talk about communal life again it's important that we have activities that we see one another as much as we can because we don't have the ability or the luxury like they did living next to the masjid the way that they did. And it's okay, no one should frown on someone who doesn't live close to the masjid. Circumstances and accommodations are different, just as lands are different. But the point here to be understood is that the communal life, for this reason, for the physical body to exist and for the religious um, benefit and the growth spiritually has to be established without it then there is no ummah and without ummah there is no jama'ah and this jama'ah Allah wa ta'ala we mentioned he commanded us to gather upon this way many times when we talk about this the mere the mere gathering is the only thing that's looked at that we came together and Allah azza wa jal he mentioned the likes of this ideology when he said تحسبهم جميعا وقلوبهم شتى talking about the Jews they gather together on the outside it looks like wow they are strong look at them they are a nice group but their hearts are not united they are hating they are bickering they are holding hostilities and um, in some cases Allah musta'an fighting and killing one another while on the outside it looks like they were a solid structure 
they are a complete ummah, they are a jama'ah. So when we talk about this issue, perhaps we suffer from some of those same ailments that doesn't give the full benefit to us as a jama'ah, as a community, as a single body. And we understand that in the time of the Prophet, people were dispatched to different places to go visit and to do tasks and to do da'wah, but they were still part of the jama'ah. They were still part of what we understand to be the group of Muslims. And we have a false concept, a fallacy that if a group or individual leaves from a particular city or a group of people or disassociates by relocating himself from a particular building, then they say he left the jama'ah. Mm. Akhi, why are you leaving the jama'ah? You're moving? Oh, subhanAllah, he's leaving the jama'ah. Laysa hakada. It's not to be understood like that. As long as the person, as we mentioned, the origin of the jama'ah is the worship of Allah Tabarak wa ta'ala. And that you be with the Muslims that are like-minded, that there are, uh, people are um, anti-radical. And this is a big discussion. We won't open the door to what is radicalism, but anything basically that's other than authentic Islam with guidelines and the lack of extremism, then this is what's understood to be a person who's upon the jama'ah. And this is why the Prophet, he said, the jama'ah, man wafaq al haq wa la kuntu wahda, or kama qab. The jama'ah, the main body, the ones that are gathering upon the truth, the community, is the one who agrees or he or she settles upon the truth to the best of their ability, even if they be alone. Because the reality is there may be a day where people will be alone. They won't have the ability to physically gather. But if they at heart wish that they could, desire that they could, and they themselves remain upon that which the original body of the Muslims were upon, فَأَنْتُمْ جَمَعَهِنَّ إِذَنْ Then you are the jama'ah. And this is يعني, some of the looks at this issue of the importance of communal life and why we should have communal life. When us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the tawfiq wa sada, let's call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for success, completion of that goal and for that which is direction. When us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a yukfilana dunubana wa kifian siyatina wa tawafana ma'a barra. We ask Allah to forgive us for our shortcomings, to overlook our sins, pardon us, and make us die the death of the righteous. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa sallam at tasliman kithira wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Any um, questions, as we will have questions and answers at the end of the night, that's general. Anything around the topic, any um, advice? Anything, uh, mistakes that I made, corrections or additions to help out with the topic? We'll start with the women first. Naam, fadali. show uh, the verbal noun to, to gather is this an example of a, a word in which shows a noun to have action yes ma'am this is barakallahu fiki and i like to may allah bless you bless us all i like to give the example like when you're in a building and we have um, commonly the exit sign the exit sign above the door which is the fire code most places most have them especially here in the states and other states and countries as well. In Arabic, this is called kharuj, kharuj, kharuj. Can you say kharuj? Kharuj. Kharuj. Kuluku ma'abad. All of you, kharuj. Kharuj. Naam. So kharuj, it means exit. So we understand that that is on what side of the line. Is it a, a ism, a, a, a noun, or is it fi'l, a verb? It's an ism because it's a place. It's an actual doorway, an exit, a departure. At the same time, at some point, that kharuj, which is the exit point, is not going to be empty. 
someone is going to exit out of that Khuruj. So the person who's leaving out of the doorway doesn't change it from being a ver uh, uh, pardon me, a noun. It's still considered an ism, a noun. But the fact that he or she is doing that action at the same time, it becomes a verbal noun because you can actually see an action unfolding while it also in the original context is from the ism, the noun family. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Are you sure? I can I can go over it again. It's important we understand. I'm not shy at all. In other words, the person is exiting. Uh, yeah, but n yes, ma'am. Yeah, maybe another example. Okay. Of how, uh, a noun becomes an action. Um, oh. Okay. Shows action in yeah. Uh, I I guess the analogy of the exit sign. Okay. Uh, maybe as an action that we embody as a, uh, a participant. In Juma, um, specifically uh, means on uh, an idealism, uh, uh, we're on the correct path, I guess. <laughs> 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 I understand. That's okay. This is this is one of the things that um, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mentions in the Prophet. He mentioned it, and to this day, people of knowledge they mention the issue of being patient with knowledge because things just don't come all at once. And the, the very fact that the person isn't shy to keep trying, as they're trying, the barakah is coming down. You don't see the blessing of Allah coming down as you try, try, and try. When the door opens and you say, hey, okay, mashallah, then that's when you see it. And this is the teacher's patience so the people don't give up. And it shows the interaction between the people and the stimulation of the people's minds and their hearts. So it's no problem. No one needs to feel belittled or annoyed. This is the way of knowledge. We'll try another example or we'll take that example again. It's not that something transforms from a noun to a verb, but they call it a verbal noun, meaning it's a noun clearly, a person, place, or a thing. But within that noun, you can look at that noun and see an action being done or exemplified by someone at the same time. How is that? MashaAllah. Allah. 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 And this is what they call Masdar. It's a verb. No, it's a noun. But that noun, normally you just see person, place, a thing. You don't see an action. But this special type of noun shows you, allows you to look through the window of that noun and you actually see some type of enactment of a action taking place and that's what's called a verbal noun. So the exit of the door is a noun. But if you look long enough, you'll see someone coming in and out and that's what makes it a verbal noun. It's a place or a thing that people want to do actions revolving around that noun, that place or that thing. Does that make more sense? Yeah, it reminded me of uh, during Ramadan when the decree Allah Akbar, a perfect example. You're awesome. May Allah bless you. Alhamdulillah. And this is the issue of al jamaah It is a it is a group of people, but at the same time, if you look through that jamaah the window of that verbal noun, you can see the people gathering and moving, participating like we're doing now, bringing food, kif halu, mashallah, how are you, salam alaikum, how's your mother, I heard she was sick, mashallah, can you call the adhan, this is what you see, the movement, the activity inside of that noun called al jamaa thus al jamaa is a verbal noun, it's a group of people, which within it you see the gathering of activity upon what is correct. And a sacred trust is in the world. Yeah, no. Okay, nice. Tayyip, in the recognition of that. Tayyip, Barakallahu Fiki, from the brothers. I have a question. No. Uh, the distinction between uh, the meaning of Ummah in the different texts, uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu mentions it, is somewhat confusing because we know that he was sent to the Ummah as a whole, meaning everyone. Almost Java, almost the Java from uh, his time to Yom Kiyama. Uh, in the hadith you mentioned concerning the 73 sects, 
I saw an explanation by some of the scholars that said that uh, when he mentions his ummah, he's talking about everyone, ummah al ijab, ummah da'wah, and that the one that was on the truth was the Muslims in general, and the other 73 were those who were outside the fold of Islam completely. So, how do we distinguish when he mentions ummah as to whether he's talking about the Muslims themselves? or he's talking about everyone in a, in, in a general way. Jazakumullah <laughs> khairan. I didn't want to get that much in detail. I just wanted to show the correlation or the correlation between Ummah as um, Imam Razi mentioned that Ummah means Jama'ah. That both of them mean Jama'ah together. And of course if the Prophet Sallam was the last prophet, then the ummah is going to be under his banner. It's not going to be under any other prophet because he's the last prophet. But when you talk about a jama'ah, then the whole world didn't gather in Medina. He was the only one in Medina with the Sahaba. So this is the origin of um, a jama'ah from that perspective. And only brought the way that it's used to show people gathering upon a tawheed. So if we talk about the nations before, then ummah is to be understood almost like a jama'ah in the sense that they're gathering upon a religious doctrine or creed. But when you get technical and you talk about the Muslims only, then jama'ah applies to the Muslim body rather than the other nations before. So we only use it to show it shows the meaning at times, like jama'ah meaning together and to do something religiously. And I didn't want to get that in detail and because this is now aqidah and manhaj and it takes a, a little bit more. So that's why I didn't open it that far. Just wanted to show the correlation between ummah. As some people, they use that, say, we're one ummat. But they mean we are jama'ah. They mean that we are jama'ah. Does that kind of make sense? So, no, if it doesn't, just tell me and we'll try them. The word wasn't necessarily jama'ah, it's the word ummah in the text uh, and how it's used. Because sometimes it refers to, we know the Prophet was sent to everybody, but the ummah of Muhammad is broken up into two groups. You see what I'm saying? But we, in my presentation, I'll give you a copy, you can listen to it. I only used it from the dictionary standpoint, showing that ummah and jama'ah means the same to gather. As you're not going to be an ummah, except that you gather. That's why the ummah that accepted his call, they became what? And they became what? Muslim. Aye, well, they became Muslim. Those who didn't accept this call, they didn't become Muslim. Why? Because this is the same issue we're talking about gathering, but it's on a larger scale. But the word is used interchangeably like that when you're just talking about gathering communal life. The, the, the issue that I'm asking is, is not that. Is when you read the text and the word of Umm is mentioned in the different hadith and such, how do you distinguish which group is being talked about? Because commonly uh, noted is that when you read this hadith about the 73 sects, we take that to mean the Muslims, right? That the Muslims will divide, the Muslims themselves, right? Ummah here means the Muslims. But in, some scholars have given the definition that this, this Ummah meant everybody, and that the one that would be safe and hellfire was the Muslims by themselves, but the other 72 were Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, Jews, because of the, the generality of the Prophet's message. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to understand, when you read these texts, how do you know what, what, what is there to distinguish whether he's talking about the Muslims when it's almost mentioned or he's talking with the Hadith is, you know, pertaining to everybody? Again, I, uh, if you're asking me this because I use the word Ummah and uh, Jama'ah in the presentation, then I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is explain to you, I didn't want to go that far, that's why I didn't. I just wanted the people to understand as Ummah and as Jama'ah means to gather. On, on that basic level. When you start talking about this, this is a whole nother, like, we should sit on the side and talk about this because it's stuff people need to 
learn and study and you read something that you understand maybe other people won't and if we go on to all of this back and forth and explaining people might be more confused because this is really technical and that's why some of them give the definition that this means the Hindus the Buddha and all those people didn't accept Islam and all of the Muslims are going to be in Jannah or in, or in even if they have to go to the fire for punishment and then they come out and others say no this is strictly talking about the Muslim Ummah those who left Islam and you know there's a lot of ways to leave Islam you make Istihza the Prophet you make mockery of the Prophet and you believe in that mockery and you know that this is mockery you leave Islam if you say for example there's another Prophet after the Prophet وسلم, like in America Elijah Muhammad they say he was a Prophet if a person was really Muslim and took that way and understood that, he leaves Islam. If a person says that Allah came in the form of Baby G or Alfonso and these things like the five percenters, a'udhu billah, he leaves Islam if he was Muslim. So those are the ones who are going to be in the fire from the 73. Meaning, youth hear Islam, alaysanihim wa laysa fi kulubihim. They make outwardly Islam, but in their heart, they don't have it. Mithlu munafiqeen, like the munafiqeen. And we ask Allah to make us safe and not from the hypocrites. Will the munafiq go in the fire and come out and go to Jannah, or will they burn forever in the hellfire? Forever. Huh? Forever. forever. He said forever. What about from the sisters, the people that die and they were munafiqeen? Will they burn in the fire forever, or will they burn for a time and go to paradise? Anybody from the sisters? Hypocrites, will they go to the fire and come out and eventually go to paradise or will they burn in the hellfire forever? Huh? The first one? Okay, Barakallahu Fiki. Nah, they're going to burn forever. But what do they do? They make salah, they fast, they pay zakat. So some take that opinion and others take the other opinion. And that's because this type of text is a text that's yani dhanni. So you have two types of texts. Qata'i is clear and no type of scrutiny needed. And everybody's going to look at it and come away with the same opinion and the same view. Then you have a text, and this is including the Quran, as well as the Hadith text, the Adhani, meaning it leaves room for having a perception this way or that way, and this is why you have some scholars give that explanation that you mentioned, Barakalofi, and others give the other explanation. And there are other meanings that they render from this type of Hadith too. So that's why I didn't want to open, but this is one of the ways you can distinguish. It either means this or it either means that. And it's for the person at the end of the day to try to stay clear from both of them. Not accepting Islam, being from the ones that the Prophet called, and they're from his ummah, meaning he had to call them. He's from the people that he's responsible for. Or being from the Muslims that leave Islam, although they claim Islam, and they burn in the fire forever. Allahu ta'ala a'lam, and Allah knows best. Barakallahu feek. Mafhum. Yikafi. Sufficient. I like that feet. Want to shake it? Mashallah. Tell you any more from the brother side on the topic. Easy question. Fabdal. Easy one, inshallah ta'ala. Um, <laughs> Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, is the statement of Adam or the people of the past that connected him to just being a nabi, or is there any other views connected to being from the rusul? It's um, Ibn Qayyim al Juziyah mentioned in Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah as well that it's Ijma that Adam is from the Nabiyun, he's a prophet. And some of them also said that uh, he's described in the hadith of Bukhari as Kalam Allah, meaning that Allah spoke directly to him. No, not Kalam, Kalim Allah. Kalim Allah, Asif, Kalim Allah. Yeah, Kalima Rahman, Allah spoke directly to him. So, he's a prophet by consensus, not a messenger. 
Jazakallah khair. So, inshallah, break time. What time? No. It's uh, 5 minutes after 12, which is actually in the wrong point. Allah is the Rafiq, mashallah. Anta the khairan. Allah bless you, inshallah. Awesome. So inshallah we'll stop here for a 20 minute break for those people who want to stretch, socialize, bathroom, um, vending area, and we'll come back after 20 minutes inshallah for the next portion. Jazakumallah khayran wa sallallahu wa sallallahu wa sallallahu wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillah wa alameen.